All right, guys, so the moment you've been waiting for, as you can see behind me, I've got my mate Lance's 79. So yes, the handbrake kits are available. Well, they're, after this video, they're gonna be available for the 79s, 76s. Uh, the same kit will also fit on the 80s and 105s that have got the part-time four-wheel drive transfer case. So um, yeah, basically, what is it, 2016? 2016 79 series, uh, lack of a handbrake like pretty much everyone else's. And yeah, we're gonna quickly, we'll go through and have a look at everything on the bench. And uh, yeah, then we'll get to installing this. So I guess before I forget, the most commonly asked questions that you guys are gonna have, I guess is, is the caliper waterproof? And how's it go in river crossings? Yes, it is, it's O-ring sealed. Um, I've been through many deep river crossings. It has had no water damage. It works perfectly every time. Mechanical override, yes, it does have a mechanical override. If you are stuck, you can take the motor off. I'll run, it, I'll run through it all on the bench. Um, but yeah, you can take the motor off and basically unwind or wind in the piston of the caliper mechanically. So yes, I've basically thought of everything and done as much as possible to kind of make it as bulletproof as possible because myself, like all you guys, take my car off-road and through river crossings, dirt, mud, hit rocks, all that stuff. So for now, handbrake install, we'll run you through how it works. We'll take it for a drive, test it out. And uh, yeah, everyone with a 79, 76, basically every Land Cruiser can have a functioning handbrake. So let's do it. All right guys, so this is basically what you get with the HF1 kit. So as you can see, it's all nicely laid out. Not that that matters, but uh, I suppose we'll start. We've got the disc, so this is a custom designed and machined billet hub. Um, so that basically sits over the output shaft of the transfer case and puts the disc kind of set back, which kind of needed for the HF transfer cases. So all the stuff that you see that is like the anodized black, that is a very strong 7075 T6 aluminium. So that stuff is, it's probably the equivalent, well, as close as of an equivalent to steel that you can get with aluminium, but you know, half the weight still. And then it's got a nice mil spec black hard anodizing on it. So super durable coating, very scratch resistant. And it just gives a nice kind of sleek appearance. So got the disc. The bracket, um, it's not really much on this, but it's been carefully crafted, so the speedo sensor kind of wiring should go past there. And um, yeah, it's, you'll see in the install, it's a bit of a, it was a real nightmare on this one to try and get all the packaging to work, uh, especially to suit all different cars with this transfer case. So I'm pretty happy with how it's turned out. I don't really think I can do it any better. Uh, there were probably about 15 revisions on this bracket just to get everything to work, but nonetheless, that's that. Uh, we've got the caliper. So this is a nice electric Willwood caliper. These things are absolutely brilliant. I run one of these on my surf and it's been absolutely flawless. Um, yes, they're full waterproof. Um, O-ring motor, so the motor seal to the caliper is all O-ring. So it, I've been through tons of river crossings with mine and it's been fine, so. And yes, there is a manual override for the caliper, which I'll pull this apart and show you how to do that in a sec. Um, but moving on, uh, obviously we've got the mounting hardware for the bracket and we've got the mounting hardware for the caliper. Um, when it comes to wiring, I'll cover this later on in the video more in depth, but I've kind of given the core components, so like, you know, real fuse, switch and um, the loom for the switch, uh, the plug and loom for the caliper and then the control unit. So the reason why I did that is because everyone's car is going to be different. Everyone's going to want to wire it up differently. Um, I know whenever I get kind of pre-made wiring harnesses, I end up basically not using most of it because I make my own and customize whatever. So I've kind of given you guys the core essentials so I'm not wasting money and costing you guys extra money paying for a whole loom that you may not even use. But yeah, plug for caliper. This is for the power, so it's a relay and a fuse. And then we've got the switch. You can run another switch, but uh, it needs to be a three position momentary. Uh, again, I cover that in the electrical kind of wiring section. But control box, looks simple, but there's a full custom designed PCB and microcontroller and everything that does everything 
with its inputs and outputs and everything. But yeah, that's basically the kit. So what I'll do before we go and bolt this on is I'll show you how you can manually override the caliper. So on the back of the caliper, there are two bolts holding the motor on. So you can get an eight mil kind of 12 point socket and undo both of these. Obviously I've loosened these in preparation. And then this will just wiggle off. So as you can see, it's got the O-ring around it. So it's all nicely sealed. So this motor just has a kind of um, splined drive that goes into the back of that. So as you can see there, there is a splined section through the middle of the caliper here. So all you need is a six mil Allen key and you can basically unwind or tighten this. So as you can see, that's winding the piston in and out. So if you're ever in a bind, not that you really will, but it's just good to know that there are fail safes. So, you know, say your battery goes flat and you need to clutch start the car, but the handbrake's on, you can jump under the car and, you know, unwind that and um, do your thing and then obviously button it all back up. But yeah, the other cool thing, the way Will would have designed this, you can actually hand this motor two different ways. So you can have it that way or you can swing it around and have it that way. So depending on your vehicle, you may have to rehand it. Um, I had to do that for the HF2 on the 80. I just had to flip it around the other way and slightly clearance the fuel tank. So we'll see shortly once we put it on the vehicle, whether what way and whether we have to rehand this, but this is another cool design feature. So, so yeah, that's it. That's uh, basically all I've really got to say. I'll stop uh, jabbering on and we'll go throw this on the car. All right guys, so the installation is pretty straightforward. All we're gonna do is remove the tail shaft, uh, just the front section. So um, hopefully there's enough slip in the slip joint still to um, just be able to undo the bolts, undo the nuts from the studs, slip this back, hang it out of the way. And then all we're gonna do is kind of bolt the bracket on, uh, put the disc on, put the caliper on, and uh, just wire it up. So I guess the first thing we'll do is just buzz these four 14 mil nuts off the tail shaft and uh, we'll hopefully hang it out of the way. Yeah, I might have to get the old breaker. breaker on that I think. Might have to drop the whole drop. shaft. Yeah. <laughs> right, so um, the tail shaft length of the slip joint is not going to allow us to take the front section of the shaft. We'll slide it back into the slip joint enough. So we're just going to remove the whole shaft. So we'll just take the four bolts off at the back, um, drop the shaft out, and then we can get on with doing that. So depending on, I guess, your lift and your vehicle setup, you may be able to do this, but in Lance's case, it's probably just a little bit too tight. So we'll just drop the shaft out and, you know, it's an extra couple of minutes, no dramas. All right, so shaft's off. The next thing to do, basically the bracket mounts on these three bolts here. Well, this bolt is no longer, but it mounts through these bolts. And then this bolt hole is plugged up with a stud on the bracket, which you'll see in a sec. So. Virgin bolts. Yeah. <laughs> Have a whiff of that. Oh really? Was it? Oh wow. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Sorry, I don't even know my own product. We actually have to take this bolt out too. <laughs> okay, so these four bolts need to come out. Um, yeah, my mistake. All right, so it's time now to grab your bracket. Um, so what you'll see. On the very top hole here, um, as I was just saying to Lance, um, basically the only spot I could fit the caliper that cleared kind of all the speedo sensors and everything on all the vehicles was one of the mounting holes right where this hole is, which is a bit of a pain. But what I've kind of done is machined an O-ring boss. So that will go back into the hole and plug it up. Um, I would also, what I'm gonna do in this case, I'm just gonna put a little bit of RTV on it just to make sure that no water can get in through that hole. I'm not sure whether that is a blind hole or whether it goes through in the oil stream, but um, that's another thing. What we're gonna do is um, all these bolts that came out, you'll notice had a sealant on them, and we've actually got some oil dripping out of this bottom one here. 
So when we put these back in, I'm just gonna put a little bit of RTV on the threads, which will just seal them back up. Um, you could also use like a low to medium strength Loctite. I find RTV works better to seal up kind of, you know, oil galleries like this, but um, yeah, the bracket will just sit on there like so. And you'll also notice that I've kind of clearanced out um, around where the uh, filler plug for the transfer case is, so hopefully there's enough room for you to get that out. Lance is actually going to let me know very soon when he does his uh, transfer case oils, but I'm pretty confident it's got enough clearance to get out because they're not much of a deep plug on these. So. All right, so just offer your bracket up. Uh, good idea as well, just to put some kind of Vaseline or something on the O-ring for this top one. And then as you can see, we've got some sealant on the threads. Just drop them in. So these will probably be a bit tight because they've obviously still got some kind of sealant left in the threads of the case. But we've well, got three M10 cap screws, which will wind into here. All right, and then grab a torque wrench and torque these down to 60 Newton meters. All right, so now it's time to put the disc on the output shaft flange. So uh, the first thing to do is make sure there's no dirt and debris on this because the abutment face uses this whole flange kind of mounting surface. So any kind of high spots like this could cause it to obviously run out of true. So just get a, a wire brush here and just kind of go around. I mean, Lance's is nice and clean, so it's a credit to you, Lance. <laughs> Not enough four-wheel driving lately. <laughs> but uh, I've seen some shockers over the years. But yeah, mainly just make sure all around the studs and just everywhere. You'll see on the disc when you've got it where it's obviously mounting to, but basically the whole flange. Also around the outside too, because it's kind of a really snug fit over that. Um, make sure there's no kind of rust or dirt build up around the outer kind of perimeter. All right guys, so on, on this model in particular, I think it's okay with the, like the 80 series for instance with the HF2 full-time case, but the um, factory bash plate on this kind of, as you can see on yours, it lips up. Um, what we've had to do is take it off because it's gonna actually interfere with the disc. What I'm planning to do is offer a bash plate that you can buy with the kit. I'm still working on developing it, but uh, as you've seen, taking the bash plate off, it's just three bolts. Whether we make a whole new one or just do one that comes off here, we'll see. But um, yes, I do plan on having that for sale with the kit as an optional extra, or you can make your own or use one of the other companies that makes them if they fit. So basically all we're gonna do is just offer up the disc. So sometimes they can be a little bit annoying to get on. Uh, if you don't get it dead true, but... Just give it a, a kind of few concentric taps with the mallet and um, yeah, it'll go on. Everything's kind of tight tolerance so that obviously there's minimal play so it all stays true when it's spinning. It is um, indexed by the spigot that goes through this disc and into the um, output shaft flange, so... It's not relying on the bolt holes to centre, but it relies on the spigot in the middle. But I've also designed it so that the outer kind of diameter that sleeves over the output shaft flange is also pretty much a locating thing as well. So you've got essentially bolt holes, the outside one and the inside. So it should spin nice and true, especially once you've got your tail shaft in. Um, but yeah, that's that. What we can do now is put the tail shaft on and then we can get to installing the caliper. Right, guys, so just a quick note. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys already know this, but when you're tightening up your tail shaft bolts, you need to really, really reef these down. So the factory torque spec is something like 80, 90 Newton meters. So, uh, I mean, if you can get a torque wrench on them and do that, that's great. I always use a breaker bar. So the max kind of torque I can put on it with that, that's kind of the torque you want to go for. So please be sure to do these up tight enough. Um, I've seen too many people kind of not go tight enough on these and tail shafts come loose and you can just imagine what happens 
I've also found the same thing with brake calipers. A lot of people don't realize how tight they're meant to be and they come loose. Thankfully, they usually catch it in time, but um, it could be catastrophic. So just, just make sure you torque these up properly and uh, you won't have a drama. All right, so now that we've got the disc and the bracket on, uh, now it's time to install the caliper. So I'll try and do this not getting my hands in the way because I'm kind of, I'm a left-hander as well, so that makes things even worse, but. All right, so when it comes to the caliper, uh, this is how it goes, essentially. So you can see, obviously, the threaded section that goes into the, the bracket. So you've got a cap screw with a washer, so that goes through there. And you've got the spacer, which goes like that. And then you've just got to get your pads either side of the disc. So what I find the easiest is to get the top one on first. So I'll kind of get the pad sorted and just pop this thread out a little bit. And I've put a decent kind of countersink on the holes, so you should be able to find the, the threads easy enough, which I've done here, so that can hang. And it's just a matter of inserting that in the spacer and then the same thing again. And then just snug these down. And then you can torque these down to 30 Newton meters. So depending on your setup and vehicle, you may have to hand the motor differently. So in this case, um, from the way that it came, I've just undone the two bolts, which you would have seen in the previous video on how to manually override the caliper. Just undo the two bolts and hold the motor, and then you can just rotate the motor to its other handed position. So that puts the motor section of the motor on the bottom side, and it clears this upper kind of um, chassis tie here. So that also gives us good access to get the plug for the loom in, which speaking of that, I think is the next thing to do. And uh, we can get this thing wired up and take it for a test. All right, so while the vehicle's up, um, we've just run the wire through into the cab. So as you can see, the caliper kind of mounts pretty cleanly. Um, it almost looks like a kind of factory component. But um, obviously, good idea to put some corrugated um, plastic conduit over the cable. So we've run a cable gland up in the underside of the cab here. So this comes out just near the handbrake box. So I'll put a photo on the screen. Uh, well, actually, I might even show in a video a bit later once we've wired it up completely, but um, it basically works out perfectly. You just kind of cable tie it to this um, rail across here, straight up through there, through a waterproof cable gland, and that will come up kind of in the, the console of the, the main kind of center console, I guess. So I guess we're pretty well done under here, but that's it. When you're putting the plug on, you just want to make sure that you push it down until it clicks and it will positive lock. Um, it won't actually stay on if it's not locked properly, so you'll realize that pretty quick. And uh, yeah, I suppose we'll head into the cab and do some wiring. All right, guys, so I'm just gonna make this kind of a blanket video for you know, every video that I do regarding this kind of electric setup. So I'll just kind of run through how everything works and how it connects. Um, because everyone kind of wires everything different and everyone's vehicle's different, I'm just going to give you the core components. So like you've got your fused relay, the switch, um, a half terminated loom that has the plug for the caliper. The other end will be unterminated, so that will just wire into uh, the harness, which we'll get into in a sec. And then obviously the control box as well. So this box essentially controls everything that the caliper does all automated all you got to do is tell it what you want it to do engage disengage and it will do the rest the really cool thing with this system is it never needs adjusting um, it's always self adjusting so when you say disengage it it'll wind the piston back for a certain amount of time and then stop and then when you want to re-engage it again it will drive the piston all the way so if the pistons all the way back it will keep driving it all the way until it clamps up and then that's your set point, it's clamped. So then the other cool thing, it will wire into your factory kind of park brake indicator light on the dash. So once it's clamped, it will 
you know, trigger through another circuit and that will turn that on. So it'll be just like a seamless factory install. So the other thing as well, I have actually designed it. I don't want you to pull it apart, but if something was to die, you can pull it apart. And instead of soldering everything on, I've done everything on screw block terminals. So this is the top with the wiring tails coming out the left. So I've got loom A and loom B, as you can see on the wiring diagram, which we will get with your unit when you buy it. So when it comes to powering the unit, um, obviously it needs to go through a relay and also needs to be fused. So that's why I kind of supplied this fused relay. So everything's just in one easy spot. All you gotta do is mount this, wire it up to the battery and uh, Bob's your uncle. I suggest having it on your ignition circuit so it's not always on. Um, you can wire that up how you want, but you do need a relay. If you're not using this one, make sure that you do use a relay and also a fuse. Um, as you can see, on the everything's on the wiring diagram, but I'll just kind of run through it here anyway. Um, then we've got the, the plug for the caliper. So uh, you can see on the plug, there's numbers one and two. One will always be red. So whether your cable has a red and a white or a red and a black, depending on which one I supply you, uh, depending on the supplier at the time, red always goes to number one, which you can see on the diagram as well. And then when we get to the switch, you can see it's got a really nice uh, aluminium tag that just screws on the back there. So this is a three position momentary. I highly recommend running this switch because I've chosen it for a reason. And the main reason is it's the hardest switch to accidentally bump, but it's also a nice clean install and it, it's just a nice clean package and it's easily kind of distinguished. Um, when the unit has power, it will give a red halo LED, like a, just a nice, nice faint one. I've got the right resistance in there, so it's not too bright. But that will just basically say, yes, the unit's running, the handbrake will work. Um, then there's, um, again, an unterminated loom, so I'll leave this for you guys, because you know, depending where you mount your unit depends on how long the looms are for this stuff. So there's no point making stuff terminated, uh, because it's, it's just gonna have to get modified. Every time I get a pre-made loom, I basically end up throwing most of it away, so. Another thing that I do suggest with your control module, instead of hard wiring everything on these looms here, I suggest kind of running a plug. So on my surf, for instance, I run a 12 pin Molex plug like that. So all these just wire into that. Obviously not, not like that, but um, these are 12 pin. There's 10 cores on these, so you've got two spare. Uh, or you could run Deutsch connectors. I also love these. I love these very much, actually. These are my favorite. Um, you could run, you know, two, two six pin Deutsch, one on each loom, um, another good setup. It's always good, it just means that if anything, if you ever need to swap it or move it or whatever, everything's terminated nicely and you can just simply unplug it instead of having to cut wires and all that crap. So I'll quickly run through the wiring for the main thing. So we'll start with loom A. The red and the white go to power. So the red will run to your pin 87 on the relay and white will go to a good ground, either at the chassis or at the battery, wherever you want to run it. So the green and the brown on Lume, they run to the caliper. So green always goes to caliper number one, which is always red. So green is red, brown is either white or black, depending what the other color is in the twin that I give you for this loom. And then the yellow on Lume A is the illumination and basically the indication circuit that goes to the illumination on the switch here. So that will go to the red wire on the switch. So that is just the illumination. And then obviously the black wire on the switch will go to ground as well. So you can run this to, you know, I, I would run it to the same ground that the unit runs to or just any kind of body ground. It's not, it's really low current, but um, obviously a nice clean ground for that. And then moving on to loom B. So that's this one here as you're looking at the unit like this. Um, the final ones I'll probably have a label or something on them, um, still kind of finalizing all those things. So obviously make sure that you follow the routing of these wires correctly because obviously it's all written and designed to work one specific way. So if you mix things up, it's probably not going to work or it will work the opposite direction. So just be mindful of that. And then the green and the brown on Loom B, they are for the factory park brake light or indicator light circuit so from what I've seen there are two different types of uh, switches so say the 80 series Land Cruiser for instance is a one wire so that takes 
basically a ground signal and when the handbrake is on that basically completes the circuit and sends ground through to the dash light and then grounds the, the globe. So I have noted it all on the wiring diagram and I will go into it deeper in the full instructions but essentially for instance for a one wire you would make the green just a ground so that can be any body ground the same as what all your other grounds are on the vehicle and then the brown will connect to the factory wire that goes from the switch on your handbrake lever you can either unplug the female connector if it's got one of those and just put a, a male male end on this and plug into that or if you're going to be using your factory handbrake as well you can just kind of splice it into that wire so then for the two wire sensors like what I have on my Hilux Surf, um, one of those wires has um, 12 volt on it and the other wire runs up to the dash light and then the other side of the dash light is grounded. So all you got to do is take um, the 12 volt side which I think is, well on mine anyway it was green or it had a green trace something on it. So that will go into the green and then the brown will go out onto the other wire that goes up to the dash. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to the wiring, really. The, I'd like to think that my diagram is pretty well comprehensive enough. If you're not kind of clued up enough on 12 volt wiring, I highly suggest that you get someone who is to do the install or to at least guide you um, because, you know, things can go wrong, but as long as you kind of follow these instructions, um, you shouldn't have an issue. The wiring is very simple. I've made it as simple as possible, so yeah, that's it. Right, so here's just a quick look at basically how we've run it on Lancer 79. So we've ended up putting a cable gland just next to where the handbrake is. Um, I might put a bit of photo on the screen just so you can see it. Um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward really. Everything fits nicely in his center console here, which is quite a nice console, I must say. Um, yeah, control box, everything's obviously got to be mounted up for good but we just put it on a plug as you can see and the relay is sitting in here so you can just see the red and the white here we ended up running that from the engine bay which has got the distribution box um, so there's a, the reds are hard active and the white is the uh, ignition so that runs the relay the ignition switches the relay on and the hard active is what gives the power to the unit comes to the switch we've just kind of temporarily pulled it out through here so Lance is probably going to end up running a uh, Land Cruiser switch here, so he's just waiting for that to get made uh, That'll be a two kind of two position or well, three position momentary. So it's a button You know a momentary button to disengage and a momentary button to engage but for the sake of Obviously taking this for a test drive in a sec. We'll uh, run with this and He'll swap it over when he gets a new switch. All right guys, so we are at the test hill um, It's a little bit dark, but She's pretty steep. That's kind of the camera level there, but she's steep. You'll see it in my uh, HF2 video in daylight, but it's about as steep as you'll find. You agree? Yes, agree. Yes. <laughs> so, um, do you want to do the stock handbrake first? Oh, well, I think we know how this is going to play out. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, so that's not pretty really... bad. <laughs> Alrighty. All right, so she's on. No feet down there. Well, we ain't moving. No. Not moving at all. <laughs> That's mad. How good is that, man? <laughs> I told you. It's unheard of. I told you, as soon as you felt it, it's gonna be it's... like next level. Oh, I'll sit here all day, thanks. What does this rig weigh? Uh, three, three. Yeah. yeah. Right so, now. Yep. Probably right. three, four. Sorry with me. Yeah. <laughs> Both us. Yeah. Well, actually, probably three. <laughs> I don't know. Three, five. No. <laughs> but um, yeah. That's unheard of. That's pretty it's sick. It's just wild, man. It's the wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Unbelievable. Uh, I'm very keen to hear some kind of feedback with the caravan. Yeah. Yeah. If it'll hold that. Two weekends so time. So 3.3 ton plus 2.6. Six. Empty. So yeah. God knows how many kitty toys and all that are going to be yeah. in there. So yeah. Hell yeah. All right. So that's it. So you reckon even with the stock one fully adjusted? Fully adjusted. It would never hold this. No, never hold. You wouldn't yeah. dare think of leaving it. 
yeah. in uh, neutral. I mean, in uh, neutral on handbrake up. Oh, definitely not. Not yeah. a chance in the world. Man, it's the it's camera never does it justice, but she's steep. I'm, it's actually I'm forward, it's 16, 17 degrees, yeah. something like that. So yeah, it's amazing. You can't even. What? There's no movement. <laughs> oh, this, Wicked man. The, the feet aren't there, guys. <laughs> it's, I can't, I'm speechless. I told you you'd be frothing. Mate, I told you. I'm frothing. <laughs> I'm parking on hills from now on. Don't leave it out of gear, though. No, no. I no. still don't trust yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But. but I don't have to pull out the bit of timber chop. <laughs> <laughs> the Toyota chop. Yeah. Oh, man. Not a chance. It's not going to happen. Awesome. Yeah. Dude, All right, put mate. it there. Yeah, it's wild, unbelievable, unbelievable. All right, it's man. So easy as well, like. Yeah, it's effortless. Nailed. And yeah, on the way here, we tried a hill start with it. And how'd you find it? Easy. This, it's no different. Like, yeah. If it was, if I was momentary button, like at the moment, I'm just holding it. Yeah. But uh, mate, if it was just press the button on a hill. Yeah, you're, you're all good. That's it. it you just literally you just bring it to ages. clutch to friction point. Yep. Just touch the switch, yep. and you're going. Yeah, there's no delay. There's no nothing at all. It's that's even crazy. That's awesome, good. man. Yeah, that's well, a great still success. Sydney. Yeah, it hasn't even moved. <laughs> and like, moved. there's probably oil on that disc too for all <laughs> from my greasy <laughs> hands. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's got some clamp force, mate. It's. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, let's go test some more hills and we'll head back and um, I quickly made up a bash plate while Lance was doing some wiring. So we'll throw that on and wrap it up, I think. All right, so Lance has just taken off for the night. As you saw in the video before this, he was pretty stoked with how that was working. So yeah, if you're seeing this, these are gonna be for sale. So these kits will fit basically 80 105 series with the part-time transfer case and also 76 and 79, 78 if they've got the same transfer. Um, I'll leave that up to you guys to decipher whether that fits, but they're for sale. They work really, really well. So when I put them on the website, I'm thinking I'm gonna put a couple of options. Uh, that website, by the way, is www.boosterbuiltgarage.com, all one word. And yeah, I actually had a message from um, my mate Adam in uh, Queensland, who I gave one of my first prototype HF2 full-time kits too, and he was towing his uh, two point, I think he was towing his race truck behind his 105, so you know there's two and a half ton for the 105, 2.6 ton for the truck and trailer. So he said it held that on every single hill, no dramas, so that's some great feedback. Lance is going to give it some tests with his caravan as we said before, so that'll be you know over probably six ton, or it'll be close to six ton, so um, yeah, this is revolutionary. They work really well. They're great for doing hill starts. They're super easy to use. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for the support, giving me the motivation to spend a lot of my time and money developing these kits. Um, I'm super stoked how they turned out and I'm sure each one of you who buy one or have bought one will be saying the same thing. Completely no adjustment needed. It's just simple hardware install little bit of wiring and you've got yourself a handbrake that will never need adjusting hold on anything and not get gummed up with mud and stuff through river crossings like rear drums do so yeah it's the best of both worlds anyway i'm gonna head home for the night and uh yeah hope you guys like this and make sure to share it around like share subscribe on our youtube channel follow us on facebook and instagram and uh yeah thank you